Welcome. You are about to view a recorded talk of the Mathematical Consciousness Science online seminar series. This seminar series aims to explore the role of mathematics in the scientific study of consciousness and hopes to connect researchers who have an interest in this topic. While every session of the seminar consists of a talk and discussions, the latter are not recorded and the following will only contain the talk. We hope you will enjoy it. For further information, please visit our website, seminar.math-consciousness.org. I was quite surprised to be invited to this lecture, and I'm still not sure whether I can really contribute uh, to a lecture series uh, on consciousness. But of course, I cannot negate that the experience of pain has something to do with consciousness. So I will discuss with you, and uh, based on my both my clinical experience and based on my uh, research work devoted to the brain mechanisms of pain, Based on that, I will discuss with you how the brain uh, generates the experience of pain. And I will do that in uh, three major parts. In the first introductory part, I will discuss with you what is pain and what is uh, special about pain. And that should serve as the basis for the second main part in which we will discuss how the brain uh, generates the pain experience. And that in turn will serve as the basis for the final part, uh, where we will discuss how we can use these basic science insights to do something really useful with it, meaning how we can improve the diagnosis and treatment of pain based on these basic science insights. So uh, let's start with uh, the first uh, introductory part of the lecture. So we have first to ask, what is uh, pain? And that's not easy to define. And the International Association for the Study of Pain, which is the leading pain research society in the world, has proposed a first definition about 50 years ago. And that has been uh, the gold standard of defining pain uh, since uh, then uh, and has been updated last year. And it now reads as follows. Uh, an, uh, pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. That reads at first glance quite easy, but uh, is the result of many years of discussions of a presidential task force of that society. And I think for research purposes, that's the best available definition of pain, but of course not the ultimate definition of pain. And we will come back to that uh, again and again. And that should serve as a starting point to discuss together some peculiarities of the pain experience. And the first question I would like to answer is what shapes the pain experience? And that's nicely illustrated here where we see uh, obviously a painful procedure before the advent of anesthesia. And we see that this doctor is uh, somehow threatening the physical integrity of this poor patient here. So pain is basically shaped by sensory information about a threat to the body. Uh, it translates that information into a subjective experience. But pain is much more than that. Uh, and when looking at another version of a very similar procedure, we can see here that a largely similar um, objective threat to the patient's body can be perceived uh, largely differently in another contextual situation. Here in the presence of this woman on the right hand, uh, the patient appears to uh, suffer much less. And also the behavioral drive of the patient to escape the source of injury here uh, appears to be much weaker. In contrast, he even helps uh, the doctor to perform this uh, painful procedure here. So that pain is not only the result of objective sensory information, 
but it's always the result of the integration of that objective sensory information with many contextual processes. For example, uh, it is integrated with the attention we pay to the source of threat, with our current expectations, with, with our future goals. And all that is integrated into uh, the pain experience. And we know that also from our everyday experience during attending to such an exciting lecture here or even giving the lecture, uh, if you have a certain type of pain that might be, might be perceived much weaker than in another situation when sitting in the armchair uh, after the lecture and focusing your attention on the source of injury. But that means that pain is highly variable. It varies not only from moment to moment, but it varies also from day to day. And even more importantly, it varies from individual to individual. And what is, but what is the biological function of pain? It's obviously an unpleasant sensation, which can be really, uh, which can really have a negative impact on your quality of life. So, but what is the function? What is the reason for experiencing pain? And again, when looking at that picture, we see this strong behavioral drive to escape from the source of injury. And that's the biological function of pain. It, we should always hold in mind that it serves to protect the body. It doesn't serve uh, to induce an unpleasant experience, which has no use at all, but only uh, the protection of the body by learning how to avoid or how to stop injury uh, or harm uh, it makes uh, sense. So in this context, it might make more sense to think about pain not so much as an unpleasant experience, but as a motivation to learn and to change uh, your behavior. And that uh, brings me to another type of pain. And this type of pain we have discussed so far is very useful. It protects your, uh, your body and it's essential for survival. Without that uh, protective function of pain, survival is difficult, if not impossible. There are rare conditions of patients where people cannot experience any pain, congenital insensitivity to pain is uh, the term for the, uh, these conditions. And these patients have a life expectancy of no more than 20 to 30 years. So it's re really our survival depends on the perception of pain. However, there are many patients who experience pain for very, very long periods of time. By definition, more at least three months, but in many cases, years, if not decades. And most probably, uh, most of you know a person suffering from long lasting pain, which is termed chronic pain. And that's a condition which is characterized not only by long lasting pain, but is also associated with severe cognitive and affective impairments, which. Uh, and we have learned only during recent years uh, to recognize. Um, and it is no longer serving protective functions, that type of pain. For example, the most prevalent type is chronic back pain that doesn't serve to protect your body, that has no bio head, has somehow lost its biological function, but represents a disease in its own right. And that is also current thinking about chronic pain as a disease in its own right, which is also reflected in the most recent versions of the international classification of diseases, which is, so to say, the official definition of diseases provided by the WHO. And what is important to note, and we will come to, back to that later on, is that it's not only a disease of peripheral tissues, for example, with respect to back pain. Back pain, chronic back pain, is not only a disease of the back, but it's also a disease of the brain. And that's very important uh, to notice and to understand uh, 
uh, as a basis for proper diagnosis and treatment. And it's a huge medical problem, um, which is indicated here. Uh, that's data from a very important study, the Global Burden of Disease Study. That's a study performed by the WHO to define the most important healthcare challenges in the world. And to this end, they have defined a few metrics to assess the importance of diseases uh, for healthcare systems in the world. And one of these metrics is years lived uh, with disability to quantify the burden of disability the disease imposes. And the left shows the top 10 causes of disability in the world. And we see low back pain is number one, headache is number two, number nine is neck pain. So it's really a huge problem. And not only in our countries here, but more or less across the world. The right panel shows in dark purple uh, countries where low back pain is the number one uh, cause of disability. And we see, apart from some parts of Asia and Southern Africa, uh, that uh, applies to most parts in the world. And in our country, for example, it's currently estimated that at least 50% of the adult population in Germany suffers from one or the other type of chronic pain. And that has detrimental effects on quality of life and also imposes a huge economic burden on individuals, healthcare systems, and society. For example, alone the costs of chronic back pain in Germany are estimated to amount to about 50 billion euros per year. So that's a huge uh, challenge to healthcare systems. So, and a final point I would like to make as a basis for further discussion is how we can measure pain. And that's a very difficult problem. And so far, honestly, the only way to measure pain is to ask the patients. And what we do in clinical practice is to ask the patients to rate their pain on such a scale, which is indicated here. But uh, that gold standard of uh, measuring pain means uh, or doesn't negate the possibility that the inability to verbally communicate that you are in pain doesn't mean that you cannot or do not experience pain. And that's very important to hold in mind. And we will also come back to that uh, later on. So to summarize uh, these uh, introductory remarks, we have discussed that pain is the result of the flexible integration of objective sensory information about threat and contextual information. And that flexible integration results in a huge variability. And that the biological function of pain is to protect the body. And this protective function depends on motivational rather than perceptual processes. And we have discussed chronic pain as a major healthcare problem, which does no longer serve protective functions, but represents in a disease in its own right. And importantly, the brain plays an important role in that disease. And we have discussed that the gold standard of assessing pain is verbal report. Okay, so far, uh, uh, a, a basis uh, for further discussions on how the brain now generates pain, the major question of today's lecture. So, and we are first to ask, how can we investigate how the brain generates uh, pain? And that's also not an easy uh, task to perform. Uh, for many reasons, uh, we are more or less restricted when we would like to understand pain in its full complexity, restricted to investigate it in humans because the full complexity, the attention, the expectations, the goals, the memories, we cannot assess in animals, which we can do for many other experiences, but for pain, that's really difficult. So we have to do that in humans. And in humans, it's not easy to investigate the brain without um, doing harm uh, to people. So we have to look for non-invasive uh, 
ways to investigate the brain. And one way is to perform functional magnetic resonance imaging. You have most probably heard about that. That is a procedure performed in such a scanner here, um, which uh, can uh, give you an, a picture of brain, fun not of only of the structure of the brain, but also of the function of the brain with a high spatial resolution in the range of millimeters. However, it has a rather low temporal resolution in the range of a few seconds. And so that technique can be nicely complemented by another technique to assess brain function non-invasively in humans. And that technique is electroencephalography, which uh, works by uh, attaching electrodes to the scalp and recording brain activity via these electrodes. And the advantage is that this technique has a very high temporal resolution in the range of milliseconds at the cost of a lower spatial resolution, which is at best in the range of centimeters. But together, uh, both types of, or both methods can provide complementary information about pain. So that's um, the tools, uh, we and others have used now for about at least 20 years to gain insights into the uh, brain processes underlying pain. And fortunately, uh, after several hundreds of studies, we are no longer dependent on one single study. And I would not like to bore you with the results of one single study, but we can perform easily meta-analysis of these uh, studies by using openly available tools. And a result can look like that, what you can see here. You see in red, uh, brain areas being activated during uh, uh, the application of pain to healthy human participants. And that's the result not of one study, but of 516 studies. And I've performed this meta-analysis yesterday in the evening. And what we can see uh, here is that brain obviously is associated with activation of many different brain areas scattered across more or less half uh, or at least large parts of the brain. So the most important lesson we have learned uh, from these studies is that there's not a single pain center or pain system or pain circuit in the brain but pain results from activity of many different brain areas and functional systems associated, for example, with uh, somatosensation, meaning sensations from the body, with motor processes, inducing behavioral responses, with cognitive control, emotional processes, learning processes, memories, and so on. So it's uh, largely extended across uh, the brain, a complex spatial pattern of brain activity. And when we look at these brain areas in more detail by using techniques with a higher temporal resolution, we notice that it's even more complex than that. When looking, for example, at one brain area indicated here on the left, uh, a part of that extended network being activated during pain, we can record brain activity from such a brain area and perform a certain type of analysis, which results in something which you see on the right hand side, which is a time frequency representation of brain activity. Indicating brain activity, color coded, increases in red, decreases in blue, has a function of time on the X axis and as a function of frequency on the y-axis. And time point zero here is the application of a painful stimulus. And what we see is an increase of uh, brain activity here at lower frequencies below 10 hertz. But at the same time, observed in the same brain area, we can also see another increase of brain activity around 80 hertz. In addition, we can also see slightly later on decreases of brain activity uh, coded in blue here, occurring around 10 and 20 hertz. So that we can conclude 
that we do not only have a complex spatial pattern of brain activity associated with pain, but also a complex temporal spectral pattern of brain activity. And that's still not the whole story. When we consider the complexity of the pain experience, and we have discussed the integration of the many processes shaping pain, when we consider that, it makes absolute sense to think about how these different brain areas communicate and exchange information and integrate their information uh, into a coherent pain um, experience and pain behavior. And indeed, what we have also learned is that communication or connectivity between brain areas plays a central role in uh, shaping pain, or maybe not in shaping pain, but what we observe is that connectivity, communication patterns change significantly when someone experiences pain. That doesn't necessarily mean uh, that connectivity shapes the pain experience. And the next thing what we have learned is that even so to say, soft modulations of the pain experience, these soft psychological effects, that they uh, can be indeed be observed to modulate patterns of pain-related brain activity. For example, a very important, clinically important uh, procedure to modulate pain is to modulate uh, patients' expectations for example, by uh, performing a placebo procedure. You most probably know about that. That's the principle is quite simple. Uh, you modulate expectations by telling, for example, participants that you perform a certain very powerful analgesic procedure. Uh, but what you in fact do is that you do not add an active ingredient to your procedure. So you say you obtain a powerful painkiller, but uh, it, the painkiller only includes, for example, inert sugar or something like that. The ethical uh, issues of that we can discuss later on, but it's still a very powerful procedure. And what we have learned is that you can modulate the pain experience very, very strongly by using these procedures. And the beauty of these procedures is that they have no serious side effects. But the question is, what happens in the brain when we perform these procedures? And what we have learned is that these soft modulations of expectations are biologically well-identifiable uh, phenomena, which you can see here. These are changes of brain activity during such a placebo procedure. So obviously our patterns change also with psychological modulations of the pain experience. But all these changes of brain activity, which we have discussed so far, are only correlations uh, with uh, pain. These are phenomena we observe during pain. We can correlate them with changes of the pain experience, for example, during psychological modulations. But is the relationship really a causal one? And honestly, this question is difficult to answer. And uh, so far, we do not have a convincing answer for that. We will, uh, but again, we will come back uh, to that uh, a bit later when we will discuss uh, perspectives and clinical applications. So we can conclude most evidence is correlative. The causality is still unclear. And another important topic to discuss is, do these or are these patterns of brain activity observed during pain, are they, are they specific for pain? Or can they be observed also during other experiences? And a uh, line of research uh, during recent years has tried to investigate uh, that uh, central question. And to that end, they have, for example, applied 
not only painful stimuli to healthy human participants, but also very strong visual or auditory stimuli, which are equally salient than pain, but not painful. And what uh, one can observe during such procedures is that the pattern we observe is at least in large parts not specific to pain, but quite similar patterns can be observed during equally salient visual, auditory, or tactile stimuli. So uh, the conclusion that when observing these patterns, one is in pain is not justified based on this lack of specificity. But the question is, what do the processes we observe, these patterns of brain activity reflect then, if not specifically pain. And one uh, factor which might be important is now to come back to that idea of pain being a strong motivation rather than a sensory experience. And I have performed an experiment a few years ago to try to disentangle or elucidate the relationship between threat to the body, our subjective experience, and our motivation to act on uh, uh, the source of injury. And our hypothesis was that we, or the current thinking is uh, mostly dominated by uh, the idea of that threat induces an unpleasant experience, which then in turn induces a certain motivation to escape from the source of injury or act against it or uh, something like that. And we speculated that it might f the other way around, at least in part, that a noxious stimulus induces a motivational drive, a behavioral drive, and that this behavioral drive is then the source of our, or the basis of our, of our conscious experience. So in, very, uh, in a very simplified view, that we notice a strong behavioral drive to, a drive to escape. And based on that, we conclude, oh, that is a very strong uh, uh, stimulus. And that unpleasantness is primarily driven by this motivational drive. And we performed a behavioral study on that and uh, found quite convincing evidence, more convincing than expected for us, uh, that indeed it's also the behavioral, it's not only that the perception drives the behavior, but also that the behavior drives uh, perception, which is an interesting uh, phenomenon. And maybe what the patterns we observe in the brain only indirectly reflect perception, but maybe more directly the motivation to do something, uh, to do something on something which is not necessarily um, a threat to the body. So uh, one idea is that this brain activity then reflect motivational drives rather than perceptual processes. So that's all nice to know. And we have in the beginning discussed uh, this protective form of acute pain and all that what I've mentioned so far uh, relates to that protective adaptive function of pain. But I've also told you that the major healthcare problem is longer lasting chronic pain. What about this type of pain? Can we also see that type of pain in the brain? And the answer is yes. For several reasons, it's much more difficult to investigate, but during recent years, uh, in, there's increasing evidence uh, that also longer lasting pain can or goes along with changes of brain activity ex in an extended network of brain areas. And this here again shows a picture of uh, these changes of brain activity in patients suffering from chronic pain. Again, not a single study, but a meta-analysis of many studies to increase the validity of the findings. So also chronic pain uh, is associated with complex patterns of brain activity. But the crucial question is now, 
are these similar patterns of brain activity, acute, protective, adaptive pain, and longer lasting pathological chronic pain, or do they differ somehow? And the answer to that question is they differ fundamentally. And that can be, for example, uh, extracted from this very important study in my view, where uh, colleagues uh, investigated a group of patients suffering from an acute episode of back pain. And I'm sure that uh, at least some of you have already also suffered from an acute back pain episode. And you know that most patients recover from uh, such a period, uh, from uh, such an episode. And uh, to capture the associated brain processes, the researchers here performed repeatedly functional magnetic resonance imaging space or, uh, scans over the course of a year. And the lower row shows the results, the brain activity patterns of patients recovering from acute pain. And we see that these pain-related activations vanish during recovery from acute pain. But the upper row shows the patients which do not recover, but who develop a chronic pain state out of that acute pain episode. And we see two important things. One thing is the brain pain-related brain activity doesn't vanish. And the second thing is the pattern changes with time. The pattern here at a visit one during the very acute state differs substantially from the pattern observed later on here after more or less a year of being in pain. You see, for example, here a brain area being activated, brain area associated with emotional, negative emotional processes, which have not been observed um, during uh, the earliest scans. So that we can learn that the pat patterns of acute and chronic pain differ substantially. And the, uh, that being or not being in pain, but also that the processing of longer lasting pain is not simply the long lasting processing of acute pain, but basically something different. And not notion which is even more important for clinical practice is that uh, this type of studies has shown that brain scans obtained during the earliest periods of acute pain not only differ from later scans, but that they can be later on be used to predict whether you end up in that lower group here recovering from pain or whether you end up in this persisting pain group here. So that means the function and also the structure of your brain during an acute pain episode predicts uh, whether you will develop chronic pain or not. A clear indicator for the crucial role the brain plays in the development of chronic pain. That doesn't mean that, the, for example, in this case, that the spine doesn't play any role in chronic back pain, but it only indicates that, it, that it's not the exclusive driver of chronic pain, but that we have also to take into account the brain when thinking about longer lasting pain. Let's summarize uh, these points. We have seen that pain is associated with complex spatial, temporal, spectral patterns of brain activity and also brain connectivity. And we have discussed that pain-related brain activity patterns can co-vary with soft psychological modulations of pain and that they can change over time. But their causality and specificity of their relationship to a pain is still unclear. However, even with these limitations of these unclear relationships uh, or, with, uh, or unclear causality and specificity of these relationships, that had already 
a large impact on clinical practice and current concepts of pain. Alone the fact that we can visualize pain in the brain has rendered pain from an elusive phenomenon to a biologically identifiable phenomenon. And that's very important. That's of central importance, uh, particularly for patients. We have discussed that patients or that, for example, the, uh, the in patient, back pain patients, that uh, their back pain cannot exclusively be explained by looking at the spine. And that leads to the fact that their pain is not is often not taken for serious because there is no reason for that. So why, there can't be pain in the back if the back is uh, looking perfectly fine on MRI scans. And it's a huge relief for these patients that they are now taken much more serious because we now know that uh, what they experience is not, not something yeah, elusive, but it has a biological uh, foundation at least. And that has shamed, changed the concept of pain and changed clinical practice in everyday patient care. Of course, that's still an ongoing process. There's much work to do still. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, it's a huge progress. But of course, we aim uh, at bigger processes. We have still this huge problem of chronic pain. So how can we use these basic science insights uh, for practical purposes to improve the diagnosis and treatment of pain? And that's an intriguing question. And uh, that's a question which is currently very intensively debated in the pain research community, but also beyond. It's a question which is uh, discussed now for nearly a decade. And not only here in the pain research community, you see here a feature published a few years ago in Nature, another feature in Nature in leading neuroscience journals. So that's really an important uh, thing how we can use these insights for practical purposes. And one topic which always lights up is that of identifying a biomarker, an objective brain-based marker of the subjective experience of pain. And despite the con controversial discussion, nearly all researchers agree that such a biomarker would be clinically extremely helpful for improving uh, treatment of chronic pain. And why so, we will discuss in a minute. And for that reason, also the International Association for the Study of Pain has initiated uh, a presidential task force to investigate the uh, perspectives, the uses, the limitations, and also the risks of such brain-based markers, objective markers of the subjective experience of pain. And the result was a consensus statement, which is somehow the official statement of the uh, International uh, Association for the Study of Pain, which we have published as a group of uh, 11 scientists uh, three years ago now. And in the following, I will refer also repeatedly to this consensus statement. So uh, what we have thought is uh, that we shouldn't think about such a biomarker, an objective marker of subjective experience as one biomarker, but probably more as different biomarkers fulfilling different functions at different disease stages. For example, we can think about an objective marker of, of a subjective experience, which helps us to assess whether someone will later on develop chronic pain. That would be a kind of a susceptibility or prognostic biomarker. But we can also think about a diagnostic biomarker, which helps us to objectify pain. I have mentioned that the only way so far to objectify pain is to ask the patients. Of course, we will also do that in the future, but there are situations where it's not easy to obtain verbal report. For example, on the intensive care units, we cannot ask whether the patients are in pain. Or think about demented patients, infants, newborns, are they in pain? 
we have no clear indication. In these cases, such a brain-based biomarker could be extremely helpful. And maybe even more important in my subjective view would be a predictive biomarker of pain. We have many drugs and other uh, ways to treat pain, but we often do not precisely know in advance which patient will respond to which type of treatment. It's often try and error. And to have a kind of a biomarker based on brain activity, which can predict how that patient uh, should be treated, would be extremely helpful. And uh, to have a very big picture, what could also be uh, possible is to identify patterns of brain activity related to pain as a biomarker and to use that as a treatment, as a direct treatment target. If we can modify brain activity related to pain, we can maybe treat pain um, uh, by modulating brain activity directly. So that offers fascinating opportunities for optimizing uh, diagnosis and treatments of pain. And as we have discussed, that pain is associated with complex patterns of brain activity. We need strategies now which can assess such patterns of information, not pieces of information in isolation, but complex patterns. And of course, we end up with using uh, machine learning algorithms to identify such uh, patterns. And indeed, during recent years, uh, such um, strategies have been used to identify patterns of brain activity, which are possibly useful as biomarkers of pain. And that started with a very influential study published now already seven years ago, establishing probably the easiest type of biomarker, a biomarker of acute experimental pain in healthy human subjects. This here uh, study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and you probably know that that is one of the leading, if not the leading, uh, medical journal in the world. And later on, uh, other patterns of brain activity studies on that have been published. And only a few weeks ago now, a uh, study has been published, which I expect to be also highly influential. And that uh, study has investigated now patterns of brain activity related to the major clinical problem, to chronic, long-lasting uh, pain. And they have indeed succeeded uh, to do so, at least in a restricted uh, cohort of patients. And what they found was that this type of biomarker was based on patterns of brain connectivity rather than patterns of brain activity. Again, highlighting that communication in the brain is central uh, in generating uh, the pain experience. Of course, many questions are still open, but I think that's uh, an interesting way to go. And these uh, patterns then all uh, have names now, uh, but uh, these are not of uh, uh, not so relevant here in our context. And another study, also published very recently uh, in last October, also pursued another way. The former study has been a study on a diagnostic marker of chronic pain. And this study here, and it was based on fMRI recordings. And this study here pursued another approach. They used EEG recordings, which are much cheaper, which you can in principle perform uh, also at home, uh, at least in every uh, doctor's office. They have used such EEG recordings to obtain a predictive biomarker in this study, not of pain, but of depression in this kind. So they have more precisely, they have trained a cl uh, classifier in an unsupervised classifier to define different types of depression, which cannot be distinguished clinically. And then they have looked whether these, they ended up with two, so to say, 
endophenotypes of depressed patients. And then they looked whether these types responded differently to treatments or drug treatments, for example, of depression. And indeed, this was the case. And this was a very convincing study performed on hundreds of patients at different uh, uh, sites using different equipments, uh, but nevertheless needs to be replicated. But I think that's the way to go. And that there we are getting closer to real clinical applications, non-invasive cheap measurements, which can provide information to plan targeted individualized treatments of pain but also of other neurological psychiatric disorders. The principle can be easily transferred to other disorders. And that brings me to the very last part. That's of uh, using brain-based biomarkers as targets for uh, pain treatment. And the principle, uh, the idea is that we can modulate brain activity non-invasively to eventually modulate a certain symptom or uh, brain function. And that can now be done by technically quite simple techniques, uh, such as applying a very weak electrical current to the scalp. And for example, when you do that uh, using an alternating current, for example, at 10 hertz, we have seen pain-related activity changes can be observed at 10 hertz. Then we can, by using such a technique, we can specifically modulate brain activity at certain frequencies. That's a quite recent development, that technique, and its principles are still, and also its power and efficacy is still a matter of discussion. But uh, nevertheless, it offers a fascinating opportunity to modulate brain activity, and in our case, maybe to probably, uh, maybe to modulate also pain. And we have performed a first study on that, uh, which will be published uh, very soon, which has at least shown some hints that it might indeed be possible to modulate uh, brain activity, and by that also to modulate the pain experience. And that offers not only the uh, perspective of establishing novel ways, uh, novel approaches for the treatment of pain, but that offers also new insights into the lacking uh, evidence on causality of, on the causality of uh, pain or brain pain relationships. If we can modulate brain activity and end up with modulating pain, then, then that's a much stronger indicator of a causal relationship than of a simple correlation, which doesn't say anything about causality. And we can do that also with another technique, which is already around a whale neurofeedback uh, uh, is a very popular uh, strategy. The uh, basic idea is also to modulate brain activity non-invasively. But in this kind of modulation to do that, to train individuals, we record their brain activity, we give feedback to participants, uh, which translates brain activity, for example, in a visual feedback signal. And that can serve as a teaching signal for an individual to up or down regulate that certain feature of brain activity. The idea is fascinating and quite old, but unfortunately, uh, research on that uh, is so far not of highest quality. And uh, we are currently working on that. Uh, we are currently trying to uh, do that in a scientifically even more uh, sound uh, way to explore the possibility of using such strategies to probe causality and also to establish novel treatments of pain. And of course, success is not at all guaranteed, but you have to hold in mind that we have spent billions, or we, the drug, the industry, and behind that, the healthcare system has now spent billions of euros and dollars on developing novel drug treatments of chronic pain. And 
we have more or less failed during the last decades to establish novel analgesic treatments. And as compared to these efforts, the effort to investigate such uh, comparatively easy treatment strategies with no serious side effects, no opioid addiction in this case is uh, fascinating. But we have to be careful while we discuss that in the pain research community and beyond and while we critically question uh, all scientific steps Others are already doing that for commercial purposes. So if you want, you can easily buy your individual uh, marker of pain uh, with uh, at uh, this company here selling fMRI scans um, indicating whether you are in pain or not. Or here, another company selling EEG-based objective pain assessments. The pain research community agrees that the science of behind uh, these companies is at best not transparent, most probably also not sound. But we have to be careful uh, that uh, this development of such strategies uh, is, uh, uh, it is uh, uh, really maybe makes our a critical uh, attitude towards such biomarkers, at least questionable. So many open questions remain, um, which uh, I'm looking forward to discuss with you later on. We have discussed the complexity of the pain experience. And if we take that into account, that pain varies from moment to moment, from individual to individual, is it realistic at all to define a biomarker of that subjective experience. And how can we deal, for example, also once we have established such a biomarker, how do we deal with di uh, disparities between uh, the information provided by the biomarker and the information provided by the patient? If the biomarker tells us this patient is in pain and the patient says, no, I'm not in pain. What is the result then of such a strategy? And if that can happen, is it at all useful? And what is also surprising is, uh, and I'm really impressed by that, we as uh, researchers, we think up a lot about that. There's a whole research niche discussing all the day these things. But is that really needed? Have we ever asked the patients and the doctors whether they need something like that? We expect them to uh, need something like that, but are they willing to accept that? And uh, do they really need that uh, at all? Probably they do, but we haven't uh, uh, asked them systematically so far. And that was only a subjective selection. And you will find, if you're interested in that even more, uh, open questions and that update of that uh, consensus statement, which we have established uh, some years ago, and that update here has been published a few months ago, ago now. And that brings me to the uh, summary of that last part. We have discussed that multivariate assessments of brain activity might serve as objective biomarkers of the subjective experience of pain. But we should think about these biomarkers not as a single biomarker, but as maybe a set of biomarkers with different functions and different significance during different disease stages. And uh, that the definition of such biomarkers might also help us to establish and honestly to establish urgently needed novel treatment strategies of chronic pain but many fundamental issues remain to be resolved. And what, are, uh, what is a uh, perspective on possible next steps? What is needed to progress uh, uh, to, uh, with respect to that kind of research and with respect to bring it into clinical practice? What is needed is more evidence uh, with uh, lower 
level of complexity. We need mobile devices, uh, smaller devices, cheaper devices to obtain more information in different contextual situations. The situation only lying in the MRI scanner uh, cannot be the solution for the future. And what we need uh, also are large data sets. So far, the most studies have several dozens of participants at maximum 100 of patients. We need more evidence, larger data sets. And this requires that we not only create databases, but that we also share our data. That so far, um, every research group um, has its own pile of data sitting on it. And what we need is sharing the data across the community to increase the power and test the replicability of the science. And that again, in turn, depends on the standardization of procedures. So far, um, many researchers uh, perform many procedures in the way they are used to it, uh, mostly based on tradition, meaning that the analysis pipelines and the way to deal and, uh, with the data differs largely across research group. However, we are making progress on that, and you see here um, 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 uh, recommendations how to standardize for example, EEG uh, research, which has been published a few months ago. And that's a very important step forward. And we need a very systematic approaches, which are no longer driven by tradition or by the particular interest of one research group, but by a systematic assessment of brain activity patterns. And for me, a uh, lesson learned from very recent studies is that communication patterns uh, should be very precisely uh, investigated and are very promising in this respect. And we have to think out of the box, not only look at our brain imaging uh, results, but that we have to integrate maybe these signals, these data with many other types of data from other uh, body signals, genetic information, uh, information about autonomic functions, and all uh, that. And with that outlook, I will now really close, but not without uh, thanking uh, my wonderful research uh, group. Uh, they have performed uh, some of the studies I have shown to you, but many studies were also not from our lab, but from other leading labs. Um, and uh, they're doing an excellent uh, job. And uh, then I will finally thank you for your attention and patience during that hour of pain, uh, insights into pain. Thank you very much.